Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, celebrating expression, fostering talent, and connecting the community to Columbus artists, performances, exhibitions, concerts, public art, and more at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, we meet an immigrant who made his way back to art later in life. Learn about the lives of our Bhutanese Nepali neighbors through images captured by a local documentary photographer and filmmaker. And we whip up a quick bite while learning about a unique museum located just a short drive from Columbus. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Hani Hara was born in Egypt in what was then a rich mixture of cultures. At the age of 11, he came to the United States as a refugee. Although he excelled in art in his youth, Hani didn't find his way back to his art practice until much later. Let's learn how he uses his personal journey along with vibrant colors in his amazing creations. I was born in Heliopolis, Egypt, which is a suburb of Cairo. In 1951 or two, President Nasser took over the country. And at that time, especially around 1956, the, the Suez War. And so at that time, the Jews were asked to leave. A smoking Port Said greets British expeditionary forces as they arrive for an assault landing. The city had been consistently bombed for days before the amphibious operation. Oil dumps go up in flames under the pounding, and the harbor is littered with sunken vessels, some bomb victims, others scuttled by the Egyptians. We had bombs coming down. I was sleeping in my parents' bed. The whole family was in there just because we could hear all the bombs going off. And uh, that's when my dad decided that's it. Uh, and he applied for a visa. And so we went to Paris for one year waiting for our turn to come into the United States. And in 1959, I was 11 years old, we arrived in New York and took a train right to Columbus. We were sponsored by HIAS, the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, which really helps a lot of people, not just Jews, uh, but anybody that wants to go to another country because they're being abused, they'll pay their way and then you have to pay him back. And I remember my dad every month would just put that check in until he paid it all off. And uh, again, we just lucked out so much that we got to come to the United States. I love this country. As a child, you know, it took a, a year or so to get accustomed to it. Uh, they put me back at grade because of my language. But eventually I caught up pretty nicely. And my parents, God bless them, uh, they're both gone, but they really uh, wanted us to speak English at home. If you speak English at home, we're gonna learn English as well. And so it wasn't uh, you know, keeping the old country in, it was welcoming the new country. I loved painting as a child and uh, I would always doodle and my relatives would say, oh, you're good at this, you should, you know, keep going. And then uh, in high school I did it. Uh, went to college for one, uh, two semesters in fine arts, but then my dad said, uh, how about uh, switch into something that makes money, which I should have never done. I went to mechanical drawing and then Ohio State asked me to leave after that because I wasn't doing so well. <laughs> but I didn't really do any art uh, until I turned about 40, 41. I took a class uh, with a local artist uh, here in town, Lindsay Stout, and she really um, was so supportive and she says, you've got to keep going, you've got to keep going, you've got talent, and from that, I was able to create a career in the art as well as sales in business. You better love color. <laughs> it's, it's my thing. I love color. I started out with watercolors originally when I turned 40. 
uh, after I took that class, with, and it was a watercolor class with Lindsay, and it, it, the colors for me weren't bright enough, they weren't striking enough, so I switched to acrylic. And the way I start, I really have no idea what the piece is going to look like at the end. I kind of start with colors and shapes. And then if you notice my art, the faces are all, it's all about faces. And my faces, as uh, primitive as they are sometimes, they really do exude a, uh, a feeling, a mood. And uh, a lot of times my uh, collectors will say, you know, I see something different every time, every t time I look at it. And to me, it's more about that you change every day. You know, we all get up in a certain mood, so th that painting may strike you a little bit different. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, I love my faces because I get lost in them, and in reality they're all the mood I'm in it when I'm doing it. As the, the painting comes together, a lot of today's topics come out in it. That, that whole thing about immigrants, how we get here, how we uh, strive here, how our country uh, is really it's so great because of the immigrants and you know now when I see people uh, wanting to keep them out I'm thinking that's crazy um, so that does come out in the paintings a lot the people you know against other people I'll do some paintings that way that eventually will come out I did a show on the homeless one time those topics somehow come out in the paintings I travel a lot, so those inspirations come out when I walk around the streets of Brazil, Mexico, uh, Europe. Uh, you come back and you can't wait to start painting again. And, and that, those travels come out in the painting. So to me, it's about everyday life that shows up. A couple of years ago, my son said, Dad, you should try the digital art. And he got me started with a couple of the apps. And what happened is over time, I, I became pretty good at uh, figuring out what brushes, what uh, colors. And uh, so I, it's the kind of thing that uh, I, I could be watching TV with one eye and drawing on the other, uh, with the other. And um, so over, the, over time, it really became uh, the way to, that I could create, here's one, walking by the pyramids, talk about my background. <laughs> so it does come out. There's a parking, I mean, a, uh, a coin <laughs> for the parking in the middle of it. This came out too, let my people go in a sense, you know, it's, uh, that was also the theme. It's, it's funny how it just comes out. It's not like I really plan it, but uh, listen, if it's going to come out, it's going to come out. Uh, I love this piece that I did about family. You know, even grandma cooking with her love, that the food that she makes. It, I just get lost in it. I want my paintings to not just be nice to look at, but I want them to penetrate that soul. Because uh, it comes from my soul, in a sense. And, uh, you know, when somebody looks at a painting, I want them to at least take a few minutes and look at it and see what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to portray in there. To see more of Hani's work, find him on Instagram at Hani Hara Art. The refugee crisis has been and will continue to be an important topic of discussion. In our next segment, we dig into the Broad and High archives for a story with documentary photographer and filmmaker Tariq Terry. His project with Bhutanese Nepali refugees is still relevant today. Watch and learn about their journey to Central Ohio. Most 
people when they photograph refugees. They, they photograph the most dire situations where people are in their lowest point. I wanted to make sure that we look at our neighbors equally and not a refugee tourism. In every chaos, you have to at some point control it. I thought it was more appropriate for people to come and focus on the identity and the people rather than the space they're in. I myself was a refugee. I came to this country uh, as, as, as a refugee status. Um, Bhutanese and Nepalese are the latest wave of refugees that are coming to, to Columbus and the United States. Um, I photographed and documented the Somali um, refugees um, while they were coming. It was important to me to archive their stories as well. They are Ohioans, as much as you are, as much as your audience. If we don't save their history today, it's going to be gone. So what we decided to do was we decided to do the journey of, of the Bhutanese and Nepalese in three segments. Bhutan itself, where they originated from, and the journey from Bhutan to the refugee camp. They lived there for 20 some odd years, and then Ohio. In the late 80s, in the 80s, the, the king at the time wanted one country, one nation. So there was a systematic aggression towards the Nepali uh, in, indigenous people. So they were in refugee camps for 20 some odd years. From 1992, for the most people that I interviewed, all the way to 2008. So you're looking at a very, very long time to be in a refugee camp. So they were born in Bhutan, and ethnically they're Nepali. But the historical significance is extremely important, one to understand. You know, um, born in Bhutan, ancestral land, Nepali, lived in Nepal as a refugee for 20 years. So it's complex. The United States resettled over 70,000 refugees from Nepal. As central Ohio, we have the largest Bhutanese Nepali refugees. Each portrait, they'll be accompanied by a bio that talks about the person's um, journey from refugee camps to how they got to Ohio, what they're doing in Ohio. So it gives you a glimpse of understanding of what the people, your neighbors are going through. Refugees are an asset and not a liability, and that's important for us to know. Taro Dungana, he is a, a program manager at a very successful community organization. He has employees working, so he created jobs in Ohio. That, to me, is what a true refugee represents. A human being, by and large, fears the unknown. Get rid of that fear. These are, these are human beings just like you and I, and they care about their community. There are, there are people, so, so get, to know, get to know them. To see more of his work, check out TariqTerry.com. The Decorative Arts Center of Ohio is a nonprofit museum located in Lancaster. It not only engages the community with world-class exhibitions and provides art education, but also preserves and showcases the incredible 19th century Greek revival house that it calls home. In the latest installment of Kate's Quick Bites, we learn about this museum while making a tasty treat.
Joining me in the kitchen today is Jason Crable, the Executive Director of the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio. Jason, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Decorative Arts Center of oh, Ohio? I appreciate that. Thank you. So the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio is located in Lancaster, just uh, uh, half an hour away from Columbus. It opened in 2000, and we're an art and history uh, museum located in a historic home in uh, the beautiful downtown Lancaster. Um, and uh, we're free to the public. We do uh, three really big uh, exhibits a year, plus we have an arts education program, and, uh, and we preserve uh, and tell the story of the, the house, the beautiful house that we're in. That's amazing. Yeah. And like you said, not, not too far from Columbus. Really not. We're, you know, I sometimes say we're a hidden gem, although that's sort of a double-edged sword, but yeah. um, we really are not that far, and, uh, and uh, we're, a great, we're a great afternoon trip, mm -hmm. uh, weekend, day, come down to Lancaster, stop stop and see us, stop and see some of the other amazing things in town. So Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot to learn and see yeah. and do. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell me also a little bit about what we're going to make today? Sure. So we're going to make a really delicious uh, cheese cheesy artichoke uh, a dip that um, I call a, a Judy's dip because uh, my, my uh, friend Judy uh, introduced me to it. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's a great, quick... Uh, uh, warm dip for uh, for for weekends mm -hmm. at home for parties. Yeah, uh, I really I really love making. I that. mean, you had me a cheesy. I'm <laughs> I'm on board. It's, it's, this is you know, great for like the colder months. If it you're really watching is. football or having friends and family over. This sounds like a great thing to make. Yeah. Why don't you tell us what ingredients we need? Sure. You'll need a 14 ounce can of artichokes, one cup of Parmesan cheese, a cup of mayonnaise, a dash of Tabasco, or really to your liking, and a half teaspoon of lemon juice. I love that it's such a simple list of ingredients, but is there anything to keep in mind to make sure that this recipe is a success? Really, the, the, only, the only thing is to make sure that you're using marinated artichokes as opposed to the, the kind that are purely packed in oil. That's a good tip. Yeah. So before we get started on this delicious dip, tell us a little bit about the exhibitions that you have at the Decorative Arts Center. Sure. So I mentioned that uh, we do three major exhibitions a year. Um, you know, we're uh, a, the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio, but we really take a broad approach when we, when we talk about art because we consider ourselves an art and history museum. So we've had exhibits that range from fine art, pure fine art uh, exhibits, to, um, to more you know, decorative arts exhibits. Decorative arts are, uh, the, the broadest definition is um, uh, utilitarian pieces made to be beautiful. Right? Oh, that's a good so way to put it. So your furniture, I... your, you know, your candlesticks, yeah, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Yeah. It's a really sort of simple. Um, so we, we have those sorts of exhibits. We've also done photography exhibits and costume exhibits, clothing, textiles, uh, mixed media. Um, the art, uh, uh, we recently, we have an exhibit uh, that is a mix of um, taxidermy oh. and paintings and photography. So uh, we really take a broad approach to what we show. And because we don't have curators or a, or a collection in-house, every exhibit is different and every okay. exhibit really uh, sort of stretches the limits of, of, of what's possible. I That's think. incredible. Yeah. I love that too because I think some people struggle with maybe connecting with art and mm -hmm. decorative art seems like such a great way where we're all familiar with these objects that are beautiful and useful. Art is all, all around us if mm -hmm. we look for it, right? And so we really, we want to we want to share that with people. We want people to see that um, art can be, you know, the 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 multi-thousand dollar painting on the wall in a fine art museum, or it can be, you know, a piece of furniture in your house or, or the clothing you're wearing, right? Mm -hmm. um, it really, uh, there's, a, there's a broader push, and that there is context and history to that, um, you know, and so we try to explore all of that in our exhibits. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, let's get started with these ingredients. Great. Let's turn this into a dip. Sure. So it seems pretty easy. Is this sort of a... It is. It's super easy, um, which is one of the reasons I love it. Essentially, um, all, those, all these ingredients uh, that we've got, we are going to uh, put into, yep, the food processor here. <laughs> it's going to get loud. Uh, and then uh, all, all together. Okay. And we, we mix it up until it's all really well combined. Anyone can do this. Anyone Can't can do this, right? All and right. Then, so we just start... Yep. Dumping in. Okay, let me get these marinated artichokes mm -hmm. now packed in oil. Yep. They smell delicious. Mm, they do. So easy. I mean, and I think the artichokes give it that flavor, and they you do. really don't have to do much work. Flavor and texture, it's, yeah. It's... All right, we'll just dump everything in. We've got our little lemon juice, mm -hmm. a little zing, Parmesan cheese, of course, because mm -hmm. you did say it would be cheesy. Yes. You're going to deliver. Mayo, stick it all together. All right, let's get that in there. Never very attractive, but it will be delicious. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's Look really tasty. I know, right? Get that in there. Do you want to add the dash of tobacco sure. to whatever your preference is? Sure. I trust you. A little bit. Yeah, there we go. Set this here. 
Okay, here we go. Do you want to do scraping or do you want to do? to, yeah. Okay. Get all that good stuff. Okay, that was so easy. So we've got our dip almost ready to go, right. spread into the pan. What's next? So next we're just going to pop it in the oven at 350 degrees for about 20, 25 minutes or until it's puffy and brown on okay. top. Okay, yeah. we'll eyeball it. All right, I'll get it in the oven. So while our delicious dip mm -hmm. is in the oven, tell me a little bit about the arts education programs I'm at the so Decker I'm so glad you asked. So um, in addition to our exhibition program, um, we have an amazing arts education program. We have an art studio in a building behind the, behind the house um, called the Wendell Center for Arts Education where we uh, teach art classes uh, to um, students of all ages and abilities. We have regularly scheduled ongoing classes. We have a regular, regular weekly watercolor, several regular weekly watercolor classes and studio classes for elementary school kids and teenagers. And then we do one-off workshops and classes, um, sometimes based on the exhibition that's happening up in the galleries and others just when we find opportunities uh, to bring in a, a, a teacher, an artist of some, uh, with, with some, uh, some particular interest, we like to try to offer those, uh, those as well. So we, um, I mentioned the watercolor, we have a kiln, so we do ceramics, we do textiles, um, we've got some looms and sewing machines wow. as well. So we really, um, we take a broad approach to what, uh, what we can teach. Um, we've, had, uh, we've had writing and, and poetry classes uh, in the past as well, so we really, um, uh, we really try to just be uh, be as creative as possible and really meet our audience where they are. And, and the cool thing about the arts program is sometimes um, people can feel intimidated by coming into an art museum mm -hmm. or um, we're in a really beautiful old house on top of a hill in downtown Lancaster and sometimes um, people might be intimidated about being in those kinds of spaces, but I think uh, making art at any any le is really for everybody, mm -hmm. so uh, it's a nice way for us to connect in in other ways with our community and with with uh, folks all over the state. That's wonderful. So yeah. you mentioned the house. Tell me a little bit about the history behind it. Sure. You know, Lancaster is really a, a, a historic community. Um, it's the birthplace of William Tecumseh Sherman and his brother Senator John Sherman. Um, there's also uh, uh, from the 19th century uh, Senator. Uh, Thomas Ewing, who was a U.S. Senator who was, who was in Lancaster. And it just so happens that uh, our house was built by the oldest daughter of the Sherman family, oh. right next to the house she grew up in, the Sherman House. So we're right next to the, the Sherman House Museum, um, uh, built in 1835. It's a premier example of Federalist Greek Revival architecture, which um, in the early 19th century, you know, the United States was relatively young. Um, we were the new, uh, the new Athens, the new democracy in the world, and so we really looked back to all of those uh, those elements of ancient Rome and Greece and made it our own that Federalist element. But um, it's a beautiful building with beautiful high ceilings, um, lots of symmetry, lots of beautiful. Um, just beautiful architecture, a beautiful grand staircase, and uh, and as part of our interpretation, the first floor of the house is interpreted, so you can kind of see the furniture, decorative arts, the um, the wall coverings, all of those things from that early 1830s time period, as well as a later time period, the 1880s, when the second prominent family who moved into the house moved in, and so it's a nice way to kind of see the evolution of the way the house would have been decorated and the decorative arts and, and, and things in the house mm -hmm. from those time periods. It's like a perfect blend of everything that it, it stands for. It really is and, and it's a great anchor for, uh, for the, the, the art, the contemporary art and the, and the, the history that we bring into the space with our, with our exhibition program. Wonderful. Yeah. This delicious dip is out of the oven. It smells incredible. Let's dig in. Here, Great. do you want to take a little, sure. little bread? Yeah. I mean, you could do bread, you could do crackers, you could do vegetables, but why? Why? Okay. There's vegetables in You're it. You're right. It's healthy. Right, I'm going to get a little bit on here. I'm going to let you do okay. the same. Thank you. Oh, it looks so good. It does look good. Here we go. Mm. Mm. It's so cheesy. Oh, it's so good. 
You delivered on the cheese factor. Yeah, the cheese and the artichoke together, just delicious. Mm. I'm, I want to eat more of this. Me too. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Jason. Thank you for having me. To learn more about upcoming exhibits and classes, find them online at decartsohio.org. Well, that's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. Wake up early for the sun comes out. Make some coffee and put it around. I got a job that I don't really love, but the pay is good. Guess I'm a lucky one. I had a different dream, but I let it go. Now it's too late to cry. Scared of trying in my teenage years Wouldn't put myself up cause of simple fears They were chances to do something Production of Broad and High is funded in part by The Greater Columbus Arts Council Celebrating expression, fostering talent and connecting the community to Columbus artists, performances, exhibitions, concerts, public art and more at columbusmakesart.com